99.3 The Truth. You can't handle the truth right now. Ooh. That was the stupidest thing I ever heard. Let's do it. Hit it. It's time for Max World. And here we go. Everybody here. Everybody here. Let's get it started. Ha! Let's get it started. Call Matt, 244-0077, or text 809-0993. It's showtime, everybody! Showtime! Exclusively on 99.3 The Truth. Hi, Max World here, Bob and Bob Monster at Cat in the Hat here. Mac is here, too. Mac will be here shortly. Anyway, glad you joined us today on the 13th. Oh, actually, what is 7-13-16? It's not just a Wednesday, is it, Frank? Yep, this isn't any particular day other than it is uh, can Bob. I, uh, can I come in now? Yes. Well, I don't know. Can you? Well, I can. I have... Uh I haven't gone to the boys' room yet, but I'll, I'll do that during break. Well, I do that every day before the show, right? That's right. Because otherwise I have or, to run out. Or after. All right, seven minutes after the hour, eighth eighth day. Bob, the calendar's messed up. It is. It's the 13th it's day. It's the 13th. Of July in the Lord's year 2016. I'm J. Michael McCoy, and we have a... Uh, wow. I don't know what this show's going to be like. I kind of let Frank kind of set this up. And I'm not even sure if I need... Am I here for counseling? For counseling for you two? Or what am I doing here? You're going to be blown away with this story. And and this this is your brother over here. And what's your name, sir? Talk it right into the mic. Uh, David Holzhauser. You're David. Okay. And how old are you, David? 52. So you're younger than Frank. Yes. So you're the little brother. Yes. Hey, you you got to get right in front of that mic, please, okay. brother. Okay. So just call him Dave Mike, David Michael. <laughs> David Michael. Okay. I'll call him David Michael. And uh, you're Frank. Oh, my gosh. And, David, what do you think you're doing here today? Because I'll be honest with you. This is one of the oddest situations I've ever had on the radio. Uh, he said we was promoting it as, as uh, uh, someone that's been near death three times. Yeah. And um, walked away and lived walk, to tell about it. Walked away in, in the spiritual growth I've had from it. Okay, good. So we're kind of telling your story today. Yes. So Frank doesn't even need to be here. <laughs> uh, he's got some information that I don't have. Really? You know, I was young at the time. What do, what do you know that he does? Well, we'll get to that. Well, he the first couple of instances is when he was 9 and 10. So he don't remember a whole lot about He doesn't him. remember. Doesn't remember a whole lot about him. But the current thing he knows all about. And I know little about. All right, so it's uh, family feud here this afternoon. Well, perhaps it's not family feud. Perhaps it's, uh, I don't know, Peyton Place? I, I don't know. But. So did we did we blow off all our news stories today? Because there is a news story. There is? Yes, there was a bank heist today. In Des Moines? Yeah, at U.S. Bank on 2nd and Euclid. And what happened? Uh, Bob, did you, you got that on Facebook? But uh, I drove through there at a quarter to 11, and there was... There was like 30 cars in the uh, Park Fair parking lot, SUVs and cars, and then Caddy Corner on 2nd um, on, uh, and Euclid, there was another about 10 cars, so it would be a good day to pull another heist if you <laughs> had that kind of uh, criminal mind, because about half of Des Moines' police force was on 2nd and Euclid. <laughs> well, did they catch him? I don't know, Bob. I'm not sure. I'm trying to bring All that right, you, up. You looked that up. You looked that up. So, uh, David, welcome to the program today. Thank you. And we appreciate you being here. The first thing I'll ask you is, uh, you're from Des Moines. Yes. You've lived here all your life. Yes. And uh, you said you're how old now? 52. 52. And Frank, you're what? 58. 58. And so, now, your sister, where does your sister fall in this? Uh, 57. So she's, you're the oldest. I'm the oldest. And then your sister. Then my brother. And then David. And that's all there is, three. Well, and then there's a, there's a, uh, a stepbrother in there that uh, got, uh, when my dad got hooked up with another woman in a marriage, and 
divorced that woman and remarried my mother. Hmm. <laughs> Well, that that makes that makes me the love child. (laughs) (laughs) That makes you a love child. Is that what that is? All right. Well, hey, you know that's not a bad thing. Listen, I'm 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 going to tell you something. I'm not here to beat up on my dad because he, you know, he grew up being raised by two women. He didn't have a real masculine influence in his life, and um, you know, but he was the head of a dysfunctional family. Who was the head? My dad. My father was the head of a dysfunctional family. Well, every family is dysfunctional. I don't know if you figured that out yet, but every family is dysfunctional. Well, some worse than others. I don't know where's, where ours falls in, but um, but it was um, it was it chaotic, and it seemed like things never got done in our family until there was a disaster. Then when the disaster happened, then usually somebody got back to their faith and their belief in God, sat down and prayed, and things seemed to, for some reason, go away. Hmm. So your dad and mom were able to pray them away? Well, no. I, what I mean is, 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 well, my mom and my grandmother was the spiritual matriarchs of the family. My, okay, my grandmother were, was yeah. the spiritual matriarch. My dad kind of joined in later, but I'm just saying... The matriarchs of our family usually was the was the prayerful church influence in our family. My dad learned later on, but I'm just saying it, it, it usually took a disaster in our family to get something to build to a head where somebody would address it because my father was the type of person that he just didn't want to know nothing about it. He was too busy going to work, and he just didn't want to know much about the particulars of raising kids all right and and we should note that your father's passed on yeah he so he, passed away in 1996 yeah so. he's not going to be listening to this and he's not able to call in and <laughs> defend, and himself. defend himself or challenge anybody else or anything like that so that's why i'm you know that's why i'm not here to to beat him up and lay anything on him but um so my brother has been married for 32 years and his wife left him how many months ago? Um, March. She she uh, left I'm, left and went to Texas. Evidently. I'm sorry, David. That's that's not easy at all. And uh, you don't know where she's at. Uh, I do. She's in the Dallas Fort Worth area. But, okay. And why did she go there? Is that where she's from? Uh, there ended up being somebody else. Okay. So and, and so she's uh, gone off with him. Yes. And are you still legally married? Yes. Are there divorce proceedings? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. No. So he went through a pretty rough go and um, ended up taking a bunch of drugs and didn't know how many drugs he was taking and taking drugs and, and tell your story. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, let, me, let, let me start with questions. Start with questions, please. All right. So, so tell me what your childhood was like. Uh, I had a fantastic childhood. Um, okay. I always had fun, you know, didn't didn't have to be entertained by anybody. Of course, my brother and sister was older, and so I could entertain myself quite easily. Okay. And the relationship that you had with your mother and father? Uh, not so much with my father. He was, you know, he didn't hug kids and tell them, you know, hey, I love you or whatever. So, uh, but my mother was uh, efficient at, you know, just, uh, give nurturing and so forth, and she liked to read to me a lot. And uh, so, we what went. was your favorite story when you you were young? <laughs> because she knows uh, Joseph's coat of many colors. Yes, <laughs> she would read to you Joseph's coat of many colors. Yes, and did you like that story? Yes, I, I picked it about uh, at least once a week, and she'd okay. read to me almost every night. So, okay, all right. And so, um, as you watched your older brother and sister grow up, did you think you were being treated differently than they were being treated uh, by your parents they would say i was the spoiled one but uh would you say he was spoiled <laughs> well let's let's put it this way uh again without trying to beat up on my dad this well was, your dad's dead so this was it, said, it doesn't this make was, a difference well this was said later on that my dad didn't know love till my brother was born Hmm. My dad did not know what love was until my brother was born, and I'm going, well, horse pit, where does that leave me and Cindy? Would you agree with that? Do you think that your father treated uh, Cindy and Frank differently than he treated you? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
And were you the favorite son? Uh, Did he like you better? Like the Smothers Brothers. Remember the Smothers Brothers? Mom always liked you better. <laughs> I would say yes. Okay. <laughs> And and how did how Frank how did that impact you emotionally at the age of you know ten or twelve or fifteen or eighteen? Well, the kid could get away with murder. Uh, there was, I mean, my dad at a young age cracked down on me and my sister pretty tough. Uh, later on in his life, he was an alcoholic. Uh, he was probably playing in some alcohol in those days, but not anything like you you know later on before he died, and. There was some abuse that went on in our home, but my brother suffered the least of it. So that's why I I, I would say when I was when I was uh, younger, I resented the kid a little bit because I I couldn't understand I I couldn't fathom why he he was able to do the things that he could do and not have the same repercussions as me. Uh, and of course, I learned this fact later on, uh, after uh, you know, in my older years, that uh, you know, my dad made this statement that he didn't know what love was till my brother was born. And your dad said that. My dad said that. And he said that to you, or said in... that to my mother. And did you hear it? No, but it was repeated to me later on. I learned about the I learned about the statement later on in life. Like how late in life? Uh, probably in my married years. So probably in my twenties. Okay. All right, and uh, well, all right, we're, we're, we're up against the first break. Time flies when you're having fun. So we're going to stop right here, and we're going to come back, and we have uh, David Michael and uh, Frank Thomas. Uh, Frank, of course, is the Frank, the verse, and uh, David is little itty-bitty brother, and he's not so little itty-bitty. Let me tell you, I think he's taller than you are, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, plus he uh, might be a little tougher, too. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk to him, and we'll talk to you, and you folks can listen. This, this, is, this is live radio at its best, live right here on The Truth, 99.3 FM. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you. Sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcastonelive.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Hey, everybody. I brought Northern Lights pizza. And it's got Graziano sausage. (laughs) 
Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 21 minutes after 3, 321. Hey, Matt Olson, listen to this. If you want to buy or sell a new house in Iowa, right now the guy to use is Seth Walker. 577-3728. I constantly buy and sell real estate, and uh, I had a, a, a license for a while, and I was really a bad realtor. I really did. I, you got to give more respect to real estate people. I didn't. I thought, why am I giving these people this high percentage for my home uh, when, when they're not doing anything? Well, they do a lot. And the main thing they do is they keep your behind out of trouble. There's a lot of things you can do wrong when you buy or sell a house, especially when you sell a house. Oh, man, can you be held liable for some of the simplest things. And a guy like Seth Walker is not going to get you in that kind of trouble. So if you're thinking about listing a house or buying a house, give him a call. Seth Walker, 577-3728. All right. So Bob Monster at the Cat in the Hat is watching the chat and the Service Legends Truth text line at 515-809-0993. And Frank Thomas is here, of course, and uh, Jebediah is producing. And today we have a special guest, and that is Frank's little brother, because uh, uh, Frank thinks that his little brother has a wonderful story to tell about uh, struggles and, 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 well, just all kinds of stuff, and it all ends up good with Jesus. Is that yeah. right, David? Okay. Yes. So well, I already told you the happy ending. So now you just get to see how the sausage is made to get to that happy ending. <laughs> well, sausage is likely to be involved in the story at some point. But uh, uh, I was saying before the uh, saying before the break that uh, he might be a little tougher than me because uh, what did you spend twenty about twenty years of your life in taekwondo? Uh, Thirteen years uh, in taekwondo, and I taught for nine. Uh, taught my own classes, not not my own school, but. So what, what degree of a belt uh, are you now? Third degree, I had enough time in and so forth to be fourth degree and be a, a master. So do you, do you think this uh, uh, injury that you've received recently is going to put an end to that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back and, and, and challenge myself. You're, are you black belt? Yes, third degree. Third, now that's, so that means like you're three times black belt? Yes. How many degrees are there? Uh, I think nine. I've met two ninth degree black belts in my okay. life. Wow. And do you teach it or practice it or what do you do with that? Uh, I've taught it. I've judged it and I've uh, participated in tournaments. Okay. All right. And had my nose broke. <laughs> yeah. And you're active in it now? No, no. No. Okay. Not for uh, two or three years. But you don't lose your third degree black belt? No. It always stays there. You don't, not like you have to go like a driver's license and go renew it. No, I, I, I earned it. <laughs> okay. And what was it? What, what, what was it that drove you to... Because uh, that's pretty successful. What was it that drove you to that? Uh, I mean, was it self-defense? Was it just burning off a lot of resentments and energy and anger? Was it uh, something you thought you'd do for a living? Uh, no. I I'd, say, I, I'd say one thing. You were an introvert, and Taekwondo kind of drew you out of being an introvert. Oh, oh, absolutely. I can I can get up in, in front of people and speak now where, where I couldn't order an ice cream cone when I was a kid. <laughs> It was terrible. <laughs> and why was that? You just shy? Super shy. Super shy. Yes. You could. Okay. All right. And I thought he got that black belt because he wanted to defend himself from Frank. Well, actually, uh, there was an instance, right? Well, you know, the funny part of it was Dave and I were never really competitive against one another, partially because of the incident that happened in early on. But because he's about uh, sometimes seven years younger than me, six, depending on when our birthdays line up, I never had that like competitive drive to, you know, pile him into the ground in a football game or a wiffle ball game or basketball game, whatever. I never had that competitive spirit against him because we weren't close enough in age. Okay. 
Yeah, you guys were, uh, well, you're only six years apart. Well, s- sometimes seven, like I said, depending on okay. when our birthdays line up. So uh, that's true. When you're 14, he's only six or seven. And then right. when you're 21, he's right. mid-teens. Right. So I never had that desire to uh, to pulverize him and pound him on the sports. Uh, because I was a pretty good athlete. I, I was uh, I was pretty good in competitive basketball, uh, played all kinds of sports, and uh, I always tried to encourage him to play in them, and I would give him plenty of room to play because I didn't want to, you know, slap his shots back in his face, which I could have easily done. But uh, I wanted him to, I wanted him to come out of his shell, and I thought the way to do it was through sports. So I didn't have that competitive spirit against him. I mean, this kid will on a, you know, with a shotgun will outshoot me twenty. 20 days a week. I mean, the kids knock down the five quails with five shots, which is, you know, that's pretty good shooting. You know, he's a left-handed shooter, uh, and, and he's a, a good shot, and he can outshoot me three days a week. <laughs> so did you like your brother growing up? Yeah, yeah, I did. But like I said, when he was young, here's the kind of kid he was. According to you. Oh, well, according to me, I think he'd agree to this. Uh, David, don't let him character assassinate you. Well, he, if he, he was, says something you don't like, you just Well, say he's, it. he's slender now, but he was skinny as a rail when he was a kid. Just skinny. And he would, ju- he would be sitting on the floor trying to watch something, and he'd jump on your back, wrap his arms around your neck, and wrestle you. And he, it was playful. It wasn't anything. He just wanted attention. He wanted, you know, but... but I was older and my sister was older, so we didn't really have that much in common with him. So he was just trying to be, you know, an attention hound. And, you know, he would sing and hum and dance and giggle and laugh and whatever when my shows were all on that I wanted to watch. And then as soon as Floppy came on, it was dead silence in the home. Floppy must be observed. (laughs) So, would I mean, you'd basically agree with that, wouldn't you? Uh, none of that. <laughs> Good for you, David. Good for you. All right. Um, there was an incident in your childhood. How old were the both of you? Well, I would. Uh, well, I'd preface that incident by when he was nine years old. I was in my first stint at boarding academy, and he was smashed. Your, hold on, your first stint in boarding academy? So they sent you away to boarding no, school? No, uh, Well, that was in our denomination. Oh, uh, okay. I went to private school and then away to boarding academy. It right, was private. You, it wasn't because you were in trouble? No, no, oh, okay. not at all. That was just a natural transition not yet. to high school. Okay. And I was, you know, in my first stint, and it was at late fall, so, you know, I'm guessing probably about uh, um, November, October, November, when you get those really bright suns that come down in the western horizon. And my brother was riding his bicycle up Broadway. Broadway. And uh, uh, we, uh, we had a bicycle stolen. Then we had two, t- uh, my dad went out and bought us two identical two tone green. Stingrays. Stingrays. Mm-hmm. These things were the coolest bikes. They just was the neatest looking bikes because they were two tone green, and they had raised letter tires on them. They were sharp. Oh, yeah, I remember those sharp bikes. Yeah, I think he was riding mine. I'm not sure because I think it was mine that got smashed and twisted and bent. <laughs> but a driver was going up Broadway, heading west into the, one of these bright suns. It was just road height. And he just happened to be in the road, and he got creamed. Yeah, yeah. got hit by an automobile. Mom, mom told me not to go up on Broadway, and it was Friday night. It's the Sabbath's going to start. Don't go riding your bicycle up there. And I crossed the road, and and uh, I seen this bumper by my leg. And at nine years old, I heard a voice that said, "Move your leg, David." <laughs> Now that's that's the God's honest truth, and I, you wouldn't think a nine year old would hear something like that. Oh yeah, but, I do. Go ahead. Uh, I think in I think in that case, you know, that either meant that I was going to be crippled or caught up in the car, and you know, tore up that way. But uh, the 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 uh, it ended up missing my leg. It, it threw me up over the car and and onto the pavement, and of course, it bruised clear into my scalp i mean the bruising was terrible and uh no broken bones but uh there was concussion and so forth hospital stay but uh, and this was at nine nine years old and was frank the one pushing you out in the street <laughs> i i didn't see him <laughs> I, well I, as i said i was away at boarding school when it happened oh, so right. i i got the news when i was in school 
So that and were was, you concerned about your brother? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So I dropped out that year out of boarding school, and I came home and I went to public school. So I was transitioning and credits and stuff, and a lot of stuff was going on in my life. And there was this deal that 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 public school credits and private school credits didn't match up. Didn't transfer. Didn't transfer. Yeah. So I was going to end up way short on credits, and I would probably have to put in extra time. And I was actually a really good student. When I left eighth grade, before I went to boarding academy, I was pulling straight A's. I was a straight A student. Seventh and eighth grade, I was a straight A student. And so I went into boarding uh, uh, academy, and my teacher said, you can do anything you want. You have the, the IQ and the mental aptitude to do whatever you want. But you this, saying that to you? Yes. But this transition between boarding school and, and, and public school and credits not transferring and just being homesick, being away from home, kind of having a foot in the secular world, having a foot in the Christian world, I just couldn't stand school anymore, and I started smoking a lot of dope. Okay, so you're back in public school in 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 Nordville, and uh, what what public school would that have been? Uh, Saydale. Saydale. Okay, and you started smoking marijuana. Started smoking pot in about seventy three when Dark Side of the Moon came out. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> well, that's why you like Pink Floyd so much. I, I I never figured. Did Bob? Did you figure that out? It was all dope related. No. Oh, okay, I didn't either. So we was uh, then. I got interested in a girl. I decided to go back to boarding academy in 74. The the, the girl and I didn't, uh, uh, or the 73, 74, the situation didn't pan out. So I ended up dropping out of boarding academy a second time. And I come home and I was just um, dazed and confused. Did you get kicked out of boarding school? No, I I left voluntarily. the, the academy made it very difficult for boys and girls up there to pair off, even though they want people of the same faith to marry. But they make it very difficult, and they started separating uh, the boys and girls, and that was the one reason I was up there is for this particular girl. And uh, when, when that fell through, I just dropped out, and I said, I'm not going back to school at all. You know, I mean, I had everything going for me. I was pulling straight A's as a as a seventh and eighth grade student. Had good reading ability, good retention ability. Had a good memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started smoking dope, and uh, that just w- started deteriorating my memory ability, my retention ability, my desire to read. And I just was dazed and confused. And then that's when this incident all happened that that I'm about to tell you. All right. Well, why don't why don't you go ahead and tell us? Okay, so in about uh, late July, early August of 1974, we was home one day, and my uh, my my cousin, our first cousin, was there, and she really loved my brother. She was just crazy about my brother. I think she was born in '71, so she was a little bit younger than him. She just thought he walked on a cloud. And would she, you agree with that, David? <laughs> I, I suppose. You, you know who I'm talking about, right? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. She just thought he walked on a cloud. She just loved him. And, and so they was playing in the front room, and I come in there, and I had been strung out on some dope. And um, I picked this gun up that was laying in our front room, and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot your brother. Or I'm, I'm going to shoot your, your buddy, David. You know, just tease him. You're saying that to Sherry, your cousin. Yeah. You know, and I thought, I'm just going to pick this gun up and pull the trigger. <sighs> that didn't end well, did it? Was, well, it, a, was it a shotgun or was no, it No, a- here, here's what it was. It was a 45 caliber nickel-plated military Colt revolver that, we, that my dad had uh, uh, Army surplus rounds for. Um, supposedly, David seems to think we got the round somewhere. Yeah, I, I believe it's in an envelope they got back from the hospital. That, he, that they took out of you? Yes. And where did he shoot you at? Uh, in I mean, the, what part of the body? In the stomach, and it exited between the, the left side of my body and the ribs, and then it went in and it hit my elbow. So that, that was Shattered it. his elbow. Yeah, it blew my elbow. All right, well, you hear the music. That means we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back as the world turns right here with Frank and David live on The Truth. Yep, either way you hack it, it's The Truth on 99.3.
Northern Lights Pizza's amazing garlic butter makes amazing breadsticks. Now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, High V, and Graziano's. Northern Lights Pizza. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershad. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fix them problem today. If they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are going to give you an exact to the penny price on what it's going to take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home, safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about, is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're going to make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 338, 22 minutes before the top of the hour. Top of the hour, Salem Radio Network News, and we'll continue this uh, program throughout the 4 o'clock hour. Kind of a family affair here today. David Michael, who is uh, Frank Thomas's brother, little brother, uh, eight years apart. I'm sorry, six years apart. Frank is now 58, and David is 52. And Daddy clearly loved David the best. And uh, through Frank's, uh, uh, and I want to say this carefully because I don't want to be sarcastic about this, but you were participating in drugs. You were high at the time. Well, I, I won't say I was high at the time, but it, I, it was probably a night after being high. Okay. All right. And so uh, you picked up a gun that your dad had laying around. Now, where was this gun? Well, um, you, was it hidden and you went and found it? We got a text here that wants to hear David talk more. And I just want to address the texter that, that a lot of this stuff that I'm telling, David was too young to remember. So that's the David's going to tell more of his story later on. But the reason I'm telling these facts is because these are things that he may not remember at the time because he was 10 years old. Okay. Um, we never had loaded guns in the house. We had guns, and we, but we never had loaded guns. And, and, and we were taught gun safety. But something had happened uh, that night uh, that there was a, um, a, a prisoner that is, had escaped or something that had went on. There was some, some disruption in the neighborhood. I don't know what it was, but my dad had got up and loaded this gun the night before. Okay. And so this gun um, was for protection because there was somebody loose in the neighborhood and may have been in our neighborhood. My dad didn't forgot to unload the gun. 
We never had a loaded gun in the house. So ever. Was, was it loaded with a single shot or no, it a was, full it, magazine? No, it had a full clip. All right. Which was probably about nine. No, 1911 frame. So it's either going to have about seven rounds. Yeah, in. seven rounds. Yeah. Okay. So I picked the thing up, and being a 45 automatic, you had to pull it back. You, you couldn't just pull the trigger and click it like a revolver. You had to actually slide the. Yes. Slide it back. Well, what I didn't know, that kicked a shell in the chamber. Yep. Because, you know, it... And I, at almost point-blank range, shot him, and it sounded like a cap going off. Okay. It didn't sound like a, uh, the percussion of a, of, a, of a pistol going off. It sounded like a cap. And I seen him kind of go... I seen him grimace a little bit... And all this stuff started slowing down in slow motion. It was like surreal. It's like, you know, I don't know what I had smoked, but it was starting to be a little surreal, and everything started running in slow motion. And I heard my mom and my sister going, no, or something. And I sees him fall to the ground, and it didn't dawn on me what was going on. I went, and all of a sudden, they jumped, and they started screaming and started coming and seeing what was going on, and I thought, I was just dazed and confused, and I, had, I did not realize what had happened until the ambulance showed up and paramedics started coming in the house and going to cart him off to the hospital. But this bullet took the most miraculous path through this kid's body. Uh, never, never hit a bone. Uh, it went through the pancreas, the liver, the... Well, Go ahead. I think he maybe even pierced a lung, but ended up uh, just poking out the edge of my elbow. Never exited. <laughs> well, the, the, as, to my memory, the bullet done a zigzag pattern through his body. Yes. It missed all the vital organs, the heart, kidney, liver, lungs that it, I'm aware it, it of. the liver and the pancreas. Scraped, I thought it just scraped the pancreas, and it yeah. moved up and zigzagged and went through exactly two ribs— the bullet moved in his body. Nothing but the hand of God or an angel could have zigzagged that bullet through the kid's body. It it was at point blank range. There's no explanation for that. But wait a minute, hold on. You hit his kidney. No, 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 no. It didn't hit, hit any. The li- sorry, the liver and the pancreas. It hit both those. Yes. Probably through the stomach too. I'd imagine. Well, it is missed. Is this the- new information for you? Well, uh, my knowledge was it just scraped the pancreas. Okay. But you're saying it went through the liver, through the pancreas, probably through the stomach, and then came out the other side and hit your... Well, it, it would have had to have went through the stomach, but yeah, it, even as high up as it was, you'd think it hit the... Well, it, you had two holes in your stomach. You had an, an, an entrance, entrance and an, an exit, exit through your stomach. Yeah. So and do you remember this? Yeah, I remember the, the flash of the gun just freezing, and of course the sound, again, it didn't, you didn't register the sound. Okay. It was just a, a flash of light. His expression was just blank, and uh, and you felt pain. Uh, it felt like being stung by a bee, just just oh. stinging, numb. Okay, you know that, you know your leg falls asleep feeling. But did did you know you had been shot? Uh, I seen the gun, and I seen the 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 the, the, the fire come out of it. So okay. So you figured I must have been shot. Yeah, there wasn't a big and it black. started getting real wet and warm real quick. So <laughs> all right, and then did you pass out or do you remember? No. you remember going to the hospital in the ambulance. Or? Uh, I remember a, either a sheriff or a policeman being there in my mind uh, in thirty seconds or a minute, and uh, I was crying some and uh, was in shock, obviously. But uh, this cop police officer what it was uh said uh came to me i don't even know if he said my name i don't recall now which was strange but um he said uh you need to you know you need to stop crying so you can slow down your hearts so, you know you stop bleeding and instantly instantly i stopped crying so uh that was that was the right words at the right time you know so uh, was that the angel? I don't know, but but he he said the right thing at the right time. Who did the, the police officer? And, and again, what was it that he said? Uh, you need to stop crying, just just okay. to slow down the the bleeding. Okay, slow down the your heart rate. Slow, and your, yes, your bleeding. Yeah. 
All right, our guests today are uh, two brothers, uh, six years apart, and at age nine, uh, one of the brothers, Frank, uh, shot his... No, I was 16. Oh, you were 16? He was 10. He was 10, okay. He was nine when he got hit on the bike. All right, and so uh, what were the consequences well, that came to you? I mean, is, did you get charged with attempted murder? No, or? They, I mean, they, they took the gun, which ticked my dad off. Uh, they, they had to take the gun. I, I suppose check it for ballistics. I don't know why. I, I, you know, I mean, it was clearly the weapon that was used. Um, they confiscated the gun. They eventually got the gun back. But as a 16-year-old, I'm standing here thinking my life is spit. Because this is my dad's favorite son. This kid could get away with murder. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm dead. I, I, I'm dead. My dad's going to kill me. Now, now, let me just, Frank, let me just ask you. Because that's a term that a young person will use when they think mom and dad are going to come home and they're in trouble. Well, dad's just going to kill me. Did you think your father would take your life? Honestly, my dad was at work when he got the call at the... United States Post Office is where he was employed, and he got the call, and I didn't know what reaction there would be when he got home. And I know my dad was standing there, and I'm going to tell you something that, that, that makes you feel lower and well crap. This kid's being carried out on a stretcher, okay, with a gunshot at my hand. And he says, don't hurt Frank. You said that? I must have. That's what he said as he was, as they was taking him out the Don't door. Don't hurt Frank. Frank. Okay. Don't be well, mad at Frank. That sounds, that makes sense. I don't, you know, if you don't remember, but you don't deny it. No, I don't deny it. Okay. But you, it stuck with you That's, for. That was seared in my head like a branding iron. Did that, did that, um, what's the term I want? Did that endure? No, not endure. What's the term I'm trying to come up? Did you feel something special for your brother then forevermore? The, the relationship between us changed. And how did it change? Because, well, after that, I was going to protect him with my life. Uh, nobody was ever going to hurt him. Nobody was ever going to fight him that they was going to have to go through me. And, uh, you know, I was going to make sure that uh, if I went somewhere, he went somewhere. I was, you know, going to do whatever I could to make up for that. All right, uh, we're going to take our last break in this hour, uh, and then we'll come back for about seven minutes, and then uh, Salem Radio Network News, and this story only gets better, ladies and gentlemen, because God's in the middle of it, and he wants to make sure that today this story somehow touches somebody out there. That's why we tell these stories. God wants somebody to know something that David or Frank has to say, and you'll hear it too, live on The Truth. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. Northern Lights Pizza, your home of the tasty crust. Our garlic butter sauce now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, Hy-Vee, and Graziano. Northern Lights Pizza. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common, everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. 
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Ten minutes before the top of the hour, top of the hour, Salem Radio Network News, and then we'll be back with the uh, next part of this story and uh, probably conclude today. We've set aside the whole two hours. Frank told me that we needed more than an hour, and uh, I trusted you, and well, you're right. You're right. <laughs> you, you know, I'm just telling you, right. you were right. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so know. your brother, your little brother at age 10 is being taken out of your house in a stretcher because you shot him. Um, do we use the word accidentally? Yeah, it was an accidental shooting. It was, but you, but you said I'm going to shoot him. It was like playing with a play gun because you didn't think the gun was no, loaded. No, I didn't. I had no idea the gun was loaded. Okay, but one thing I wanted to quickly go back to on the on the path of the bullet, it did hit his his pancreas, and 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 they thought for a while he may end up with a colostomy bag. Now. At, at 16 years old, thinking that your little brother is going to be crapping through a hole in his side the rest of his life because of something you done. Did. Did. And I'm going, trying to work on his English. Dad, and, 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 and going on dates with girls and whatever, I'm going like, oh, Lord, don't let me be responsible for that. I, you know, I was just like praying. Our whole family went into prayer mode. Our church went into prayer mode. And this kid went into surgery. And... Here's the most interesting point about this whole story. This kid's got a rainbow scar across his abdomen. I don't know what a rainbow, so a, a, an upside down smiley face. Yeah. Well, yeah. like a rainbow. Yeah, an upside down from, smiley face. From, si- from side to side. Okay. And that scar has about eight to ten stitches holding it together. Okay. It's a hideous looking scar. It's gotten better over the years. But I found out later on... I used to tease him for being skinny. And I found out later on that had he been overweight, the doctor said they put they put that few stitches in because they didn't expect him to live through the night. Mm, mm, mm. They wow. didn't want to wa- they didn't want to waste the thread. And when did you hear that? Many years later? I learned that la- uh, later on. Uh, I learned some facts later on, but but uh, my dad, my brother won't know this. My brother won't know this, but but my dad, my dad totally didn't overreact. He actually acted pretty calm through the whole situation, and I and we had some family discussions that he felt it would be in, be in the best interest for for David if David passed away. He oh did, my! He did not think he did not he he thought his son that he loved dearly the the first time he knew love is when this kid was born he felt like that it would be better for David if David died and didn't live on to be a cripple. Well, but at what point was this? The night of the surgery? The day after the surgery? Uh, the, uh, While that, surgery? That week. That week. He was in the hospital a week, and that week we had some discussions, and he kind of felt like it would be better if, if, if he would, because we were all praying. We were in prayer mode to save this kid's life. Our, my church was praying. Everybody was praying for this kid. And how, how many days were you in the hospital, David? Do you uh, remember? About a week is what I About a week. Yeah. About seven days. Do you remember coming up from surgery? I mean, being no. awake? No. When, when did you, when do you recall being awake again? I, I, I can't, I don't remember. I remember being in the hospital and they were changing my bedding, which was uh, very painful to be rolled Was around. It? Yeah. Uh, wake up screaming, you know. Ouch. Um, and did you, and when you're in the hospital and you're waking up screaming, do you know at this point what's happened? Do you know that your uh, brother had shot you? And Yes. And did they tell, what did they tell you your condition was? Did they say uh, you're going to be just fine? I don't fine? recall none of Okay. That. All right. Do you remember them giving you uh, conditions at that time? I know later on you heard that they thought they were going to lose him that night, but you, what did they tell everything, you and your mom and everything dad? Everything that happened from the moment he after surgery defied their logic. Miracles, it, miracles. They okay. defied the doctor's expectations. Now, I want to tell you one fact about this. This is just a 
kind of like a final little fact to this whole story. Uh, I mean, it's not the end of the story, but the surgeon, Tyler, Dr. Tyler, he, he was out of Wilden Clinic on Lyon Street. And I don't know how much down the road it was, maybe a year later, but he was kind of a, a disheveled guy. He was kind of like a Columbo looking dude, you know, the dude that would be real disheveled looking. He's a professional, but he's disheveled. He's just, you know, you wouldn't think he was a doctor if you saw him on the street. <laughs> And and this guy performed maybe a, a mad scientist. Yeah. Huh? And this guy, this guy, him and God held this kid's life in his in their hands. And about within a year after that, his wife walked in Wilden Clinic and yeah. shot him dead. Shot the surgeon dead in Wilden Clinic. The the, the man that saved this. And kid's when life. was this? About a, I think it was about a year after the shooting. I think. So a, a woman, no, his, his wife, wife his, his wife walked into the clinic and shot him dead. Shot the doctor dead. For what reason? I would have guessed it was some domestic uh, cheating something. I don't, I don't know that we ever knew the story, but it was just ironic to me that the kid, that, the guy that saved this kid of a gunshot wound ended up dying of a gunshot Was wound. the woman tried and found guilty? Do, I, don't I don't know? know that I ever really followed up on the, on the case. What was the doctor's name? Google this. Tyler. Tyler. Dr. Tyler? I don't remember the first name, but he, he, he practiced out of Wilden Clinic. Okay, so Dr. Tyler, Wilden Clinic, shot and killed. Let's, let's see what comes up on the Google with this. This is crazy stuff. This, <laughs> listen, I, I, if, if this was around April 1st, I could see you thinking we're pulling an April Fool's gag on you, but we're not. I don't know much of this story. I'm learning it as you do, because that's kind of how I like to do stuff. When you... Uh, you ask anybody that's ever been on the radio with me, and they're my guest, we don't do a lot of pre-questions. My next question is based on David or Frank's last answer. To me, that's the only way you tell somebody's story. Because if David sits down or Frank sits down or the two of them sit down with me and tell me this all in advance, I want to hear it the same time you do, the listener. I want to hear about it the same time you do. So the questions you might have might be the first in my mind. Now, if you've got questions, you're welcome to call at 515-244-0007. You're also welcome to jump on the Service Legends Truth text line at 515-809-0993. Tell us what you think. And I guess uh, your niece, Jessica, which is Frank's daughter, is listening. Yes. And uh, she had encouraging words for you. Do you like Jessica? Yes. She's, she's, good. A, she's a wonderful woman, isn't she? Yes. She's yeah, a good she, girl. Yeah, she's got her stuff together. All right, so we're coming up on our uh, top of the hour break, which means we'll go to uh, national news and update you from there. If there's anything local going on, we'll update you after that. And then we'll continue this story. Uh, uh, it's, it's the David Michael and Frank Thomas. Um, it's their story. And we're, we're only to page 10, or I'm sorry, we're only to age 10. And so far, uh, uh, David's been hit by a car and survived. And then a year later, shot uh, by a uh, just a horrible man. Horrible, man, horrible <laughs> man. No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. And uh, survived that. Guess what else he survives? And guess who's got his arms around David most of his life? Yep, Jesus. And we'll talk about it. We're coming back live on The Truth.